Good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here this morning. If you are one of our guests, thank you for coming out to be with us today. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You could fill that out and place that in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in our service. You can indicate any prayer requests you have on that card, and we will be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. So I'm just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming. If you are from out of town, our prayer is safe travels for you. If you are from our community and you're looking for a church home, we would love to talk with you about how we receive new members. Just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. One of the things we like to do is acknowledge it when, uh, when one of our members does something or accomplishes something significant. And we've got a couple here this morning that just this past week celebrated a milestone in their marriage. Uh, Larry and Norma Perry have been married 60 years years. Could you guys just stand, Larry and Norma, right here? Give them a hand. It's awesome. That's a combined 120 years of marriage, when you think about it that way. That's a long time, so congratulations, guys. And for all of us who've only been married 10 or 15 or 30 or 50, it can be done. Just hang in there, all right? It can be done. Hang in there. Hey, let me ask you to stand up. Let me share a a quick verse with you here. We have a lot to do today, a long way to go. So this is a great passage for us to begin to think about our time of praise together. It's from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has witnessed something that's terrified him. Turns out it will be something that really uh, will bless him and will bless all of us. He sees the Lord. And he hears these incredible beings, and they are crying out what we're going to try and cry out this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's praise the Lord for his glory this morning. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the Virgin Birth. We believe in the Resurrection. Christ one day will return to earth. Us we believe in his blood that frees us to become the bride of 
this morning how can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word I seek you with all my heart do not let me stray from your commands I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you praise be to you Lord teach me your decrees with my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please. God. 
2 Chronicles 34, verse 14 and 15. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan. Skipping over several books to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, and something has been lost. as the book of the law of Moses that was given to Moses was lost and then found um, the only way uh, to be found is to to find the Word of God. What had been lost uh, in turning from the Lord for so many years, um, finding a life in darkness could only be found as the Word became flesh and Jesus Christ as He gave His life for us. Um, and so we take this communion together to remember uh, that Word becoming flesh and giving us life. What once was lost is now found. Pray with me. And God, we, we praise your name. Um, and we worship you and we rejoice and come together uh, to take part in a meal with you and with each other. This bread, uh, this life that was given to us through Christ's death on the cross and through his resurrection. Uh, we remember now and we praise you for God, may we take this and only think of you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the truth in it, um, the life that we receive from it, God, and the, the way that Jesus uh, was made into flesh uh, to show us what these words were, and how much they meant for us, God, for coming down to this earth and for dying for us, for shedding his blood that would cleanse us from our sin and from our brokenness and renew and restore our relationship with you. And we thank you for that and for the word that brings us closer to you. Uh, we continue this meal and rejoice and celebrate in the truth we receive from your word. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
in the room will know exactly where we were 15 years ago this morning. I was in a conference room at my office with my colleagues watching the news, overwhelmed at what we were seeing, not knowing how to make sense of it. You'll remember where you were on September 11th, 2001, when the World Trade Centers were destroyed. It was a very trying time for our nation, and it's still a painful memory for a lot of us. There are many people in this room that uh, are either in the military or retired from the military. There are a lot of us here who are first responders or who have loved ones who are first responders. Those are the folks that rush toward the smoke and fire while the rest of us run away from it. We're also part of a country that is genuinely blessed to have the kinds of freedoms that we enjoy. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, far, far from it. But in the United States, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're wealthy or poor. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. 
as a matter of your orientation. You can find respect here. It may not always come easy. It may not always be perfect. But more than any other place on the planet, in the United States, you can find that. We need to be grateful for that. We need to be humble about it. And we need to remember those that have died to protect that and times when that has been threatened and those who responded to that. I want to ask you just to take a minute and think about uh, where you were, the events during 9-11. I'm going to close this with a prayer, okay? Let's just take a moment of silence. Father, it is good for us to remember history. And we confess to you that we don't always remember it accurately, but we're trying. And we don't know all of the reasons why. We don't know how to explain all of the outcomes that have occurred since September 11th, 2001. We're just very aware, keenly aware, that it had a tremendous impact on millions of people. We pray that we would humble ourselves as individuals and as a nation and as a planet before you. We pray that your kingdom will come. And by that we mean we pray that your will will be done on earth even as it is done in heaven. We pray for peace. We pray that the hearts of those who hate will be changed. We pray that there will be forgiveness. And we pray that nothing like that will ever happen again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know what would be good right now? If you stood up and gave somebody a hug so they'd know they're not alone. Can we do that? Let's just stand up and give somebody a hug right now. good. I don't know. Okay, that's enough. You can, you can sit down now. See, I'm, I'm fixing to preach, so you want to sit down, right? Hey, thanks, thanks for being here this morning. That's awesome. Awesome. We need to do more of that. Can I just, just out of curiosity, I'd, can I see the hands of the people who love to go to yard sales? Can I just raise your hand for just a second? I want to see. Okay. A lot of folks in the balcony. My balcony people like yard sales. I love yard sales. I love yard sales, thrift stores. Sometimes, actually, we drove by a yard sale yesterday and didn't have time to stop, so I just threw money out the window. So just to let them know, right? I love yard sales. When I was... Uh, in college, I bought a sweater at a yard. Of course, now if you're in college, this is, you should know this because it's coming, okay? When you're in college, yard sales are your friend, right? So I was, uh, when I was in college, I bought a sweater at a, at a yard sale for a quarter. And I wore that sweater all, it's the best sweater I've ever had in my life, for a quarter. It was wool, it was gray and white, it like a ski sweater. It just, I looked so cool in that sweater and it only cost me a quarter. So I just, I love yard sales. I love thrift stores. But now take a look at this. This is a sweater that some folks in Illinois purchased at a, a thrift store for 50 cents. Do you notice the name in the, right there? That was verified, authenticated as belonging to famed football coach Vince Lombardi. They bought that for, my sweater was great. This one's better. Okay, because they sold it for $43,000. 50 cents, 43,000. 
That's what we call a successful investment. Okay? Take a look at this bowl. There's a family in New York bought this bowl at a yard sale for $3. I, it's not that impressive to me. It's not a very impressive bowl at all. I mean, it's okay. It's not ugly, but it just doesn't say much. They put it on the shelf for six years, and then they decided to have it appraised. Turns out that it's not just a bowl. It's from China's northern Song Dynasty. It sold at auction for $2.3 million. <laughs> Three bucks. $2.3 million. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, you're, you're wandering around a yard sale, or low mill even. You're at low mill. And you see a painting of a guy standing on a bridge screaming, and you buy it for 10 bucks and sell it for millions. That'd be, wouldn't that be awesome? Do you know what you would do after that? Besides retire? You, you would make a big donation to your church. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you would. That's exactly what you'd do. Of course, there's the flip side of yard sale, thrift store, treasure hunts. What if there's... What if there's something in my attic that is valuable beyond my wildest dreams and expectations and I don't realize it? And I have a yard sale and somebody comes along and they offer me 10 bucks for it and I sell it and then I'm watching Antiques Roadshow and I find out that my painting of Elvis and Jesus is actually worth millions. <laughs> that would be bad. It would be worse, though, if there was a treasure in your possession that could answer some of life's toughest questions. What if right under your nose you had a gift that could question some of your most settled assumptions and you never realized it? That'd be bad. Look, look with me in the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Chronicles. Shelby read from that just a minute ago. Second Chronicles actually sounds like something you'd find in the attic, right? It's really old sounding. It's in the Old Testament. You can start at, uh, you want to kind of open your Bible up to the middle. A lot of times it'll just fall open to Psalms, then back up. Or you can go from uh, Genesis sort of uh, that way to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And we're going to be in chapter 34. Let me set this up for you a little bit while, we're, while you're looking for it because it may take you a while to find it. Second Chronicles is not a highly trafficked book. Um, so Israel, this is all taking, the, the story that we're going to look at takes place about 600 years before Jesus. So that's kind of the time frame that we're looking at here. And during this time frame, uh, the kingdom of Israel is divided. They, it used to be uh, unified and then a lot of political stuff went on and they divided and you've got the northern kingdom is Israel and the southern kingdom is Judah. This story takes place in Judah, and they have had, uh, Judah has had a series of really rotten kings. I mean, horrible kings. They've all been, every one of them has been bad. Have you ever heard the word ambilateral? Ambilateral is, refers to an English word that means the same thing, even if you remove one of the letters. Now, that's what some people say it means. It's either that or it's a made-up word that teenagers gave me to throw into the sermon. I don't know which one, okay? I do know this, though. I know that you could have, you could have pulled any king out of uh, Judah's throne room and stuck in any other, and they would have all been bad for the most part. Just one series of really bad kings. The, the latest one that, uh, that has taken the throne is a guy named Ammon. And Ammon, uh, chapter 33, says that he was not like his father Manasseh who humbled himself, but Ammon increased his guilt. He was just a bad, bad guy. He was so bad that his, his own cabinet assassinated him in the palace. That's how bad he was. But the cabinet was no better because the people rebelled against them and killed all of them. And then the people installed Ammon's son, Josiah, to be king when he was eight years old. So you've got this kid who has grown up incredibly privileged. He's been raised by a bum of a father, and now he's installed as the king of Judah. He's got all this power with none of the background, none of the raising. 
You just, this looks like a train wreck that's about to happen. And then we read this in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 2. Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father, his ancestor David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Huh. Look at verse 3. In the eighth year of his reign, so he, he, he comes to the throne when he's eight. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David, his ancestor, David. So, so Josiah gets serious about his relationship with God when he is 16 years old. You could say that what Josiah did was start going deeper in his relationship with God when he was 16 years old. Now, it's really early in the sermon to do this, but I don't want to leave those couple of verses right there without offering a little bit of challenge. And the first, first thing I want to do is challenge you guys here. I think a lot of times when we're young, and it was this way when I was young, and I know that was a long time ago from your point of view. It was a long time ago from my point of view. Um, when you're young, you think, I'll get serious about the Lord one of these days. I'll, I will go deeper with the Lord one of these days. But later right? Because let me get through junior high. Mm. Let me get through high school. Yeah. Let me get through college. Woo. And then when I'm in my 20s and 30s, then I'll get serious. Problem with that is that you're almost dead by the time you're 20 or 30. All right. It's almost over, right? The other thing here is that Josiah turned to the Lord while he was still young. And, And then David did the same thing. And Jesus did the same thing. Solomon even says in the Bible, Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth, which is interesting that he says that because we've done studies now, our our religious scholars and our sociologists have done studies on people your age, and what they found out was that the time in life when people are most receptive, most ready to turn to the Lord is where you are which means, of course, the Bible said that centuries ago, and we finally caught up with our studies, but that means that right now, this time in your life is when you have the potential to have the most influence on your friends for Jesus. That's a remarkable kind of thing. Right now, not, not later, you're not, you know, not when you're 20 or 50 or whatever, but, but right now, you don't have to wait to do great things for God. God's been doing great things through kids for centuries. In fact, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, John says, I write to you young people because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. That's just, the Bible just does that all the time. So that would be my challenge to you guys. Don't, don't wait, don't wait. Now to the rest of us, to those of us who are nearly dead, um, I think the challenge in this passage is that we need to do everything we can to connect our kids, our, our children, and our teenagers with Christ. I mean, who do, you, who do you think guided Josiah so that he followed the ways of the Lord and did not turn to the right or to the left? Who, who did that? Well, it wasn't his dad. His dad was worthless in that regard. Ammon was just a, a he was awful. My money is on Hilkiah the priest, who's going to come up later on in this story. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Some people say that Hilkiah was the, the brother of Jeremiah. Some people say that he was the great-grandfather of the prophet Ezra. But I, but I think that he was likely the voice in Josiah's ear telling him to turn neither to the left nor to the right, to seek the Lord, to go deeper. Our kids need that. They need that. They need 20-somethings and 30-somethings to support them. They need the warmth and wisdom of senior Christians, people who've walked with God for decades. Most of us who are older can think of people that when we were kids, there was this, this man or this woman or this couple or this several people, older people who were there for us. It's our turn now to be there for them and for kids even younger than these folks. And it's biblical. Elisha had Elijah, David had Samuel and Nathan, Timothy and Titus had Paul. As individuals and as a church, one of our highest priorities has to be passing on the faith to new generations. And everybody goes, absolutely, that's absolutely right. And then we don't really do much with that. So can I I just put some wheels on it here for you for just a second to give you an idea about what I'm talking about? Let me just give you three ideas 
All right, and you can, one of them you, you absolutely auto embrace, the other two, you, but just suggestions. I would start with just developing some personal relationships. You guys are going to hate me for this because when this service is over, old people are going to come up and meet you, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Get to know them. Develop a personal relationship with them. They, they need that. They, they need for us to know their names, to, to know what's going on with them. To, to be a familiar face in their lives. to be th- So develop a personal relationship. I don't care how old you are. The older, the better. There'll be some great relationships that could be developed here. I have a friend right now. He was here last week. When, when he and I met, I was a senior in high school. He's like 100 now, and we're still the best friends. I met him when I was a senior in high school, and he, he got to know me personally. I got to know him personally. That matters. That matters. Number two, pray. Pray. Pray for our kids. Do you know how hard it is to be a kid these days? It's almost impossible to be a kid and love the Lord. But it can be done. Kids are doing it. These kids are doing it. Pray for them. And and as you get to know them personally, you can know very specifically what to pray for them. You can pray really targeted prayers for them. But I would encourage you to get to know them personally. Pray with them. Pray for them all the time. Now, here's the third one. And some of you are going to go, oh, I can't believe you said that. And it's going to be, I'm, and I'm, all, I'm just trying to put a thought in your head, okay? Just an idea. You may not be in a position to do it. It may not be your thing. That's okay, all right? But if this makes you uncomfortable, that's kind of my job, right? Okay. Some of us are in a position financially. We've got really good income or we've got resources. We could actually do some estate planning and include the church in that estate planning so that the church has the resources it needs to create the infrastructure and the environment and have the tools it needs to help connect these kids and our younger children with Jesus. I'm not telling you you have to do it. I'm not saying if you don't do it, you're a bad Christian. I'm just saying that's a thought I want to put into your head, that the church needs the resources to get that done. You need to think about that and pray about that. Okay? But we, you guys got to start now going deeper. Don't wait. And we got to be there and help them do it. Okay, that's where, that, that's where all that, I think, is going. Okay, so back to the sermon. Now, uh, at 16, Josiah begins seeking the Lord. That period of going deeper goes on for about four years. When he's 20, he starts getting rid of all of the idols the people have been worshiping. That's what verse 4 in Second Chronicles 34 is about. It says he destroyed the high places. The high places were where they had their pagan worship services. So he's getting rid of all that, pagan worship sites. Then at 26... When he's 26 years old, he initiates a huge restoration project on the temple. And it's while the workers are restoring the temple that they find buried treasure. Look at verses 14 through 19, 2 Chronicles 34. While, and Shelby read part of this a minute ago. While they were bringing the money, bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest, told you he'd come up, here he is, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the Lord, the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Apparently, some earlier kings had tried to destroy the book of the law, and so some priest with some foresight hid hid a copy in the temple. And now Hilkiah and the workers have found that. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, who's kind of like the chief of staff for Josiah, I have found the book of the law of the, in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the, sur- the supervisors and workers. And then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. Tearing your robes was a way of dramatically demonstrating sorrow, remorse. Why, why, why did jo- Josiah do that? Why was he overcome with sorrow? For years, he's been seeking the Lord. He's been doing this now for 10 years, 16 to to, uh, to 26. He's been seeking the Lord. He's been doing some good things. He's been doing great things. But he has not been doing the right things. 
And do you know why he had not been doing the right things? It wasn't because his heart was bad. He had a good heart. He had a great heart. He wasn't, his failure to do the right things was not because he didn't want to do the right things. This kid was passionate about doing things right. He wasn't doing the right things because he did not know the right things to do. It's that simple. But when they found the book, when they discovered that treasure, then he knew. Here's a phrase, I, you know, we, every week we have kind of a, here's the thing I want you to get. So here's the thing I want you to get. You can't do God's will if you don't know God's will. You can't do God's will if you don't know God's will. Look, you're here in church on a Sunday morning. I have no doubt that you want to make the right decision if you encounter an ethical dilemma at work or at school this week. Of course you do. Yeah, I, I've got no doubt that if a friend or a colleague or a neighbor comes to you and they want your counsel on something, I have no doubt that you want to steer them in the right direction. When you see brokenness in your neighborhood or in your school or among your friends or in your own home, something in you wants to rise up and confront that brokenness and bring healing to it. You've got a good heart. You want to do good things. You want to do the right things. But if you don't know what the right things are, you're not going to be able to do them. You can't do God's will if you don't know God's will. That's what this story is about. A good guy, great guy. He's trying. And, and yet he discovers that even with all his good intentions, he still needs guidance, the guidance that comes from the Word of God. That's, that, that's, that theme, it comes up all over the place in the Bible. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Colossae. That was a good church. I mean, you look at some of the churches in the New Testament, you go, hmm, not so good. But Colossae was a good church, good bunch of folks. But still, listen to what he says to them. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with, look at this, to fill you with the knowledge of his will. I want God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And then he says, because I, I, do, I pray in that, because I want you to live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you bear fruit, you, have good, you see good results from the work that you do for the Lord, and you are grow, a life pleasing to the Lord, is one where you are growing in the knowledge of God. He says it twice right there in those two verses. Growing in the knowledge of God. Peter wrote to a group of folks who were trying to do things right. But he warned them that there were people who would try to lead them astray. And so he writes this, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless, uh, of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Look at verse 18 but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I love the phrase that both Paul and Peter used. Grow in knowledge. Grow in knowledge. They're not telling us that we need to get advanced degrees in Bible. They're just saying you need to grow. Where, wherever you are in your knowledge of, of Scripture, Go a little further today than you, than you did yesterday. Whatever you know, learn a little more. If you want to go deeper in your relationship with God, grow in knowledge of God's Word. Can I just tell you one way to do that? I mean, we kind of put wheels on this idea of, of, of you guys starting early to turn deeper to the Lord and then us being there for you. Let me put some wheels on this idea of growing a little deeper. And you're gonna, when, when I say this, you're going to go, oh, come on, man. Are you serious? Sunday school. I, it, that sounds like, are you, come on, really? Sunday school? I mean, that's like ancient. That's like so, well, that's like something you'd find in the attic and sell at a yard sale, right? It is. You know what else is old? Indoor plumbing, and I like it. I think it's awesome. Some things stick around because they, they work. Sunday school is one of those things. Look, we have people teaching classes 
that, have, that really do have advanced degrees in Bible, people that have walked with the Lord for decades. We, we can learn stuff from them. I was in a class this morning and learned some stuff in that class. I would just challenge you to do that. It's not, if that's not a part of your regular Sunday routine, why don't you go a little bit deeper? Put yourself in a situation where you have a chance to learn. In January, we're really going to be really re revamping our, our adult Sunday school program. We're really going to be talking to you about that down the road a little bit, but we're, we're trying to invest more in it so that we can get more out of it. I just want to put, put that challenge out there for you right now. Go deeper by growing in your knowledge. Why? Why do we, why do we need to know more? I mean, why, did, why did Paul and Peter tell their churches to grow in knowledge? Why did Josiah tear his robes when he heard the word of God for the first time in his life, when he heard the word with virgin ears? Why is the longest chapter in the Bible a 176-verse poem about God's word? Why does the very first psalm celebrate the person who chews on the word of God day and night? Why were the prophets Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and John told not just to read the book, but to eat the book? Why did Jesus tell people to uh, say that, that people don't just live by, uh, by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God? Why does the Bible make such a big deal about the Bible? Because in every era, the Bible gives us a truer account of what is going on in an unraveling world, an account more accurate than the one the politicians and journalists give. Because as Eugene Peterson writes, these are words intended to get inside of us, to deal with our souls, to form a life that is congruent with the world God has created and the salvation God has enacted and the community that God has gathered the Bible makes such a big deal about the Bible because if we don't know and live by these words, then the only sources of wisdom we have to guide us are the whims of culture, which today lean this way and tomorrow lean the other, or the inclinations of our own hearts. Now, according to Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest, that's how you're Look inside yourself. Follow your heart. Do what makes you happy. Believe in you. Be you. Discover your deepest desires and fulfill them. And that all sounds so awesome until we meet somebody like Hitler. And then we're reminded that the human heart is not so reliable a guide. We're reminded that the human heart is capable of creating almost impenetrable darkness and unspeakable violence and appalling injustice, which is something God knew all the way back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw how great the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil all the time. We need to grow in knowledge, not just so we'll know what's wrong with us, but so that we can learn remedy, which is precisely the story the Bible tells. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he made us in his image, and we were in perfect harmony. We were in perfect harmony with the environment and with each other. God, and then we rebelled against God. We believed a lie about God, and that ruined every relationship we had. It ruined our relationship with the planet. It ruined our relationships with each other, and it ruined our relationship with with God. So he had every right. God had every right to go start over on another planet. And in our galaxy alone, he had 100 billion planets to choose from. But he didn't. Because even before we were ruined, he decided to rescue us. And so he took this one family and he, he built them into a great nation. And he gave them his law. And he outlined the blessings that would come with obedience and the consequences that would accrue from disobedience obedience, and he even provided a system of sacrifice to deal with the sins that, that, that they would inevitably commit. But no matter how many times God repeated his promises and affirmed his covenant, they continually turned away, and still God refused to give up. Instead, he doubled down. He came among us. He came. God came. 
to live here among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And even though he lived a perfect life, they killed him on a Roman cross and buried him in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And then we realized who he was. God in flesh. And that he, and that he had made the final sacrifice, taking our punishment and securing for us a relationship with God through nothing but pure, free and if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, God credits us with his righteousness and fills us with his spirit. And instead of, a, instead of a single nation, we're welcomed into a multinational, multi-ethnic fellowship of believers from every nation under heaven and enabled to serve God and each other in love until he returns. That's the Bible. That's the story the Bible tells. Every verse in the Bible is a part of that story. And by story, I don't mean something that begins with once upon a time and ends with happily ever after. I mean the Bible offers a narrative that you and I can live into and become our story. It can become the trajectory of our lives. It can become the script by which we live but we can't live it if we don't learn it. We cannot do God's will if we don't know God's will. So my challenge to you this morning is to find the treasure that you have buried in your attic or in the back seat of your car or somewhere on your laptop or tablet or phone and unearth it and read it and let God's Spirit work in it and around it and through it to take that word and make that word your story. Know it. Because if we don't know it, we can never live it. Let's, have a, let's stand again. Let's have a prayer here and then we're going to sing one more song. Oh God, thank you so much for your word for your scripture. Thank you for inspiring, breathing into people the message that you wanted to communicate to us. Thank you for protecting it through the centuries from people who would have destroyed it. Thank you for teachers who can unpack it so that we can hear it and understand it, know it, and then live it. Forgive when we have failed to live what we know. Forgive us when we have failed to understand what we've read. Bless us with insight and wisdom. Let your spirit guide us as we encounter your word. It's his word. He inspired it. Help us to embrace it, learn it, love it. And God, more than anything, help us to live it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come. today. I do want to point your attention again to your bulletin to remember there are several upcoming events. Par Golf Tournament is coming up. The 39ers have an event this week. Tonight we'll be back here at 5 for the spring. Come back and join us for our instrumental praise and worship time. Fall small groups are kicking off. Outback America is coming up. A lot of good information in there. Uh, again, thanks for being here. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you at 5 o'clock. Let's close in prayer.
Would you please bow with me? Holy Spirit, rain down on us. We acknowledge your presence here this morning, teaching and equipping us to go deeper in. Please bring to our remembrance today, Father, you are our firm foundation and we stand on your promises. We believe that you are the author and the finisher of our faith, our buried and now unearthed treasure. Because of this, we rejoice we meditate and we delight in your word, which is the light of our path. Father, be with us as we study your word to grow in knowledge of your word so that we may obey your word. We acknowledge you, Lord, as the light of man, the light that shines into the darkness of this world. Father, thank you for this body of believers at Twickingham. Thank you for our families, our husbands, our wives, and our children. Thank you for our military, men and women serving all over this globe. Thank you for our police officers and all of our first responders. Thank you for our teachers and our mentors who help us to go deeper into your word. Bless us now, Lord, as we depart and make a difference in the lives of everybody that you place into our path. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. <laughs>